candidates. Thank you very much for these kind words, uh, Mr. Chairman. Before I begin, I would like to say many thanks to Sri Jayan Prasad and his team at IDSA for organizing this wonderful conference, and also many thanks to Mr. Peter Rimmele and his team at Konrad Adenauer Foundation for inviting me. Now, among the, the other big players, the European Union takes a somewhat difficult position when it comes to foreign and security policy in West Asia. And this is mainly due to a number of internal factors that I want to point out here. And I will argue that in Europe, domestic foreign and security policies have become to, to an extent intertwined. Now, we can, ex we can observe three major trends on the national, the inter-European, and the international levels. First of all, there's a, on the national level, there's a major split between Europeans on issues such as the refugee crisis, but also on the question of globalization and liberalism. Many people feel excluded and scared by political developments they do not understand. And in Germany, for example, the economy is in excellent shape. However, many people do not feel confident about their future anymore. And much of it has to do with how the refugee crisis was handled. So we are at a point where the classic correlation between the economy and social well-being is now not valid anymore, but it's determined by factors related to foreign and security policy. And this is a phenomenon that is very new to Central Europe. And this split in the, inside the societies has given uh, rise to right-wing movements across Europe. And in some European countries, of course, as we all know, these movements have come into power, such as in Hungary, Poland, and Italy. On the second level, foreign and security policy are still domains largely determined on the national and not the European level. Because different member states have different positions on relevant matters based on their own political calculations and their economic outlook, or sometimes also post-colonial interests. And the third point is, of course, the international environment we've been talking about already, and of increasing instability and insecure alliances. We're now potentially faced with a hard Brexit. The transatlantic relationship is no longer reliable that we have relied on for decades. European leaders, <coughs> especially Germany, are now carefully testing the waters with old, well-known players, such as Russia and Turkey, in spite of all the conflicts and disagreements, just to be sure to keep a dialogue on cooperation open. Now, <clears throat> most EU member states understand that the current crises require a closer cooperation, both in terms of European matters and foreign and security policies. So in 2016, in the wake of the terrorist attacks in Paris, the global strategy on European foreign and security policy was put into place and has since been implemented for the last two years. It facilitates closer cooperation in fighting terrorism, prevention of radicalization, cybersecurity, and intervention in crisis regions. But this last point of the intervention in crisis regions brings me already to the next challenge. If we look at the crises in the Middle East, there's another crucial element in European foreign policy, a challenge that goes back to the very foundation of the European vision. And this foundation lies in the values of a liberal democracy and rule of law in all its aspects, and this includes political pl and social pluralism, separation of powers, human rights, but also reconciliation, etc. And these are the values we Europeans deeply believe in, especially after seeing Europe destroyed by two major wars in the 20th century. Now, the dilemma lies in the fact that we apply these principles also when it comes to foreign policy by attempting to strengthen what we perceive as potential conduits of democracy. And we saw this, of course, as never before during the so-called Arab Spring, when there was a serious belief among European elites that the Muslim Brotherhood could actually transform Middle Eastern states into democracies that could one day even become somewhat liberal. And the fall of the old autocratic allies was welcomed in the case of Egypt, Mubarak, if not actively supported, as in Libya, by, by NATO and the fall of Gaddafi. Now, we all know where this has led us, a military dictatorship in Egypt and total chaos in Libya with the small parts of the population who actually did work towards liberal democracies in prison or killed. So this value-based approach contains a severe dilemma because reality in the Middle East and other parts of the world often does not correspond to our value-based principles. 
So at this moment, our foreign policy is like any other foreign policy also guided by economic and security interests, which may at times, of course, contradict to a value-based approach. Now, unfortunately, in many cases, this dilemma leads to the fact that we do not have a clear profile or strategy on how to end wars and crises in the Middle East, strategies that can actually be implemented on the ground. We do have great strategies in our multi-level soft power tools to reconstruct countries, provide humanitarian support, trainings in security, defense, rule of law, parliamentarism, etc. Such as the one we are implementing since, uh, since April, the new strategy in Iraq. Uh, we are also upgrading NATO to make it more efficient in disaster management and response to crisis. However, our crisis policies themselves at times oscillate between our values on the one hand and our security interests on the other. And it's in the nature of things that these can be contradictory. So at this point of time, with the lessons learned from the Arab Spring, the tendency goes away from values towards more security concerns. So we support autocratic regimes again, such as in Egypt, through economic and technical support, credits, because stability and security are the priority, especially in the face of thousands of potential refugees from African countries. So our strategy has become to avoid risks and unpredictability. We see this policy in Egypt, but also in Libya, where we have been criticized for collaborating with the Coast Guard, who sends the refugee back to the inhumane conditions of the detention centers, an issue the European Union is trying to solve by enforcing the closing of these centers and training Libyan security personnel in dealing with the refugees in a more humane way. So based on this premise, I want to look at the case of Syria, given the, the briefness of time. Um, and I want to use Syria as the major case study here, since there's, there's uh, no time to go to the other countries. Going back to 2011, 2012, Europeans did believe in a value-based solution to the crisis in Syria. And of course, I'm intentionally simplifying here. Europe was in support of a pro-democracy revolt that would probably get rid of Assad, hold talks between the conflicting parties, facilitate reconciliation, and have free elections. Now, unfortunately, this did not pan out so well. And actually, for so quite some time, we closed our eyes to the fact that most of the rebels were not defenders of liberal democracy, but rather of their own interests and that the revolution was hijacked by Sunni Islamists. And moreover, in summer 2015, we were suddenly confronted with a wave of refugees at our doorsteps, whom Germany allowed in, which was used by smuggler gangs to trick refugees to travel to Germany by promising them money, housing, and work. We all know the story. And now we are faced with two major problems. Europe has been flooded with refugees, and Assad, whom we consider a war criminal and major perpetrator after now, after the defeat of Daesh, is about to win the war. And I think the refugee issue is the best example of how domestic policy, inner European policy, foreign policy, and security policy have merged. On the domestic level, in Germany and in Europe in general, there is a strong division about how to deal with the refugee crisis. I mentioned in this in, my, in, in the opening, which has shaken the very foundation of European norms and values. Now, between 2015 and 2017, uh, Europe has received 3.6 million refugees entering Europe, and 50% of them came from Syria, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Now, of course, compared to the ratio of population and refugees in Jordan and Lebanon, this is a really manageable number. However, Europeans were not prepared that this would happen, and this is where the big problem lies. And radicals have used the chaos of 2015, the terror attacks in Europe, as well as criminal acts committed by some refugees to gain political momentum. On the inner European level, there has been a struggle for a solution. On the one hand, we have the Dublin Agreement calling for the registration of refugees in the country of arrival, mainly in Greece, Italy, and Spain. And on the other hand, we have the call for a comprehensive European solution pushed by Germany, but it has not materialized until today, which calls for a fair distribution of refugees among all European countries. Now, on the foreign policy level, with the European solution failing, Angela Merkel was pressured to find another solution and started negotiating with Turkey. And Erdogan, of course, enjoyed this new position of power 
and made Europe pay a very high price for stopping smugglers and refugees from embarking on their journey to Europe. And last, on the security level, since spring 2016, NATO has played an essential role in patrolling the Mediterranean and stopping smugglers. Adding a few words about the war in Syria itself, the European stand on Syria has been very clear. Europe has condemned acts of war against the Syrian population and has called to bring the responsible parties to the International Criminal Court. In this way, Europe has of course indirectly supported a regime change, even if it has not been part of the war itself. Europeans have also made clear that they will be part of reconstructing Syria, but only if new elections are held, including all, Syrian, all sections of the Syrian society. And this stance, of course, is, in my opinion, very honorable and worthy of support, because it expresses a genuine concern to restore peace and prosperity in Syria. However, once more, the problem is the reality on the ground. Assad and his allies are about to win the war. Not to talk to Assad means not to be part of post-war talks. And free elections, whether we like it or not, probably will not happen anytime soon. And at the same time, the solution of the refugee problem and also Europe's future role in the region would involve talking to the future rulers of Syria, which includes Assad, Russia, Turkey, and Iran. And of course, we, the European Union is resuming indirect talks through Russia and Turkey, but it's still refusing to talk to Assad. On the humanitarian level, with over 12 million refugees and many of them IDPs, a dialogue with Assad will, however, be necessary sooner or later. And I believe European leaders at this time are moving into this direction because they recognize this need. Now, in the UN-led Geneva talks, there's a feeling that with lacking political will in Washington and the vanishing role of, of the US, any EU conference in Syria can only deal with the symptoms however, not the drivers of the conflict. And on the other hand, as we have just heard from Dr. Hel uh, Dr. Elena, Russia and, and, and Turkey sponsored their own Astana peace talks. And of course, Russia and Turkey were on opposing sides in the, in the conflict um, during the war all along. And still, they're finding a way to come together to hold peace talks uh, together with Iran in parallel to the Geneva talks on, on a Syrian constitution, refugees, the whole issue. And the problem is, from my perspective, it is a problem. The EU so far is not involved. And um, the EU is, is, of course, involved in the Geneva talks, but the Geneva talks are stuck at the moment. They are trying to revive them. But from my opinion, the EU should take a stronger role. Now, with everything said, I would also like to point out where I see the strength of European policy and how this strength is played out, also can be played out in the future. European strength has always led in diplomatic efforts behind the scenes to resolve crises and create win-win situations. Especially Germany has always had a reputation as an honest broker and trustworthy partner. So you have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, we have seen this, for instance, in the successful German mediation in the prisoner exchanges between Israel and Hezbollah. And of course, mediating behind closed doors is much more taxing, time-consuming, and less newsworthy than a military intervention. Moreover, the European soft power arsenal and crisis management, humanitarian assistance, security training, and political economic and economic development is, I would say, outstanding on a global scale. And in a post-war situation, um, and, and faced with the task of a sustainable and comprehensive reconstruction, the European Union is indeed a leading power. And this is currently playing out in Iraq and will certainly play a role in post-war Syria. We should also keep in mind that the European Union is a very complex structure that serves the interests of 28 nation states and is bound by their opinions and national interests, which makes decision-making processes rather slow and bureaucratic. And I would argue that the current crisis and the changing global order do not only present a tremendous challenge to the European Union, but also offer an opportunity to strengthen the European role in West Asia and to make strategies of intervention more efficient. This includes, first of all, and I conclude with this, a stronger engagement with Turkey, uh, clear relations with Turkey, given its decisive role in Syria, but also in the light of its current move away from democracy that we have to face. It includes also a stronger regional cooperation in the question of future migration from North Africa, the prevention of terrorism, maritime security, etc. 
And of course, it can also include a stronger mediating role in the Saudi-Iranian divide and the related conflicts in Yemen and other conflicts in the region. And of course, given the unstable transatlantic relations, it includes also looking for new partners in Asia. And this could include to build on the, and I'm, I'm concluding with this phrase, the European Indian Strategic Partnership of 2004, which since 2016 has acquired a strong focus on security policy in terms of cybersecurity, anti-piracy, and non-proliferation. And there are many possibilities to build on and much room for joint initiatives. So I believe now it's time for Europe to step up and to take the opportunities that we find in the midst of all the challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you.